Imagine a fantasy series that is really a metaphor of modern cultural appropriation. Better yet, let's focus on the background that author Fonda Lee has created in the Jade Bone Saga. The setting is a parallel 20th century world with two superpowers, Espenia, which prizes capitalism and parallels United States, and Yucatan, which very vaguely parallels the Soviet Union. A small Asian-inspired island called Kikon is under the rule of the nation of Shotar. Kikon is the only place that produces bioenergetic jade. The people of Kikon have evolved into the only people who can safely channel the energy of bioenergetic jade into physical powers that appear almost magical. The powers mimic the fantastical martial arts abilities you see on TV, including steel, which makes your skin hard enough to stop bullets, strength, which is what you think it is, perception, which lets you read emotions, lightness, which makes you so light you can defy gravity, deflection, which lets you create these telekinetic walls that you can push around, and channeling, which lets you kill with a touch or alternately to heal. By the way, if you are not trained and do not have the natural Kikanese abilities to use Jade, you come down with something called the Itches, where eventually you go insane and murder the people around you. A system has risen up around those with the ability to use Jade, where the people who are trained to use it are called Green Bones and belong to a clan devoted to protecting the island. However, if you are a Green Bone, you cannot rule the island. The Kikanese have a saying, Jade and Gold never together. Now, the original natives of Kikon, the Abukai, are immune to the influence of Jade, and the modern Kikanese people probably evolved their abilities from settlers mixing with the original Aboriginal Abuke. Those who are still pure-blooded Abuke still cannot channel Jade, and once in a while a Kikanese is born who is also immune, and those are called Stone Eyes. But, like I said, even with the abilities of the Green Bones, they could not stop being conquered by the Shotar, a neighboring country with better technology and a larger population. But then, a world war breaks out called the Many Nations Wars, which changes the geopolitical landscape. Shotar is left weakened, and this is a perfect opportunity for the people of Kikon to rise up, which is exactly what they did. The Greenbones, the warriors of Kikon, who have a strict honor system and are devoted to protecting the island of Kikon, manage to overthrow the Shotar and declare their independence. But the two great heroes who work together to lead the revolution have different philosophies on the direction of Kikon in the modern world. Call Sen, who is called the Torch of Kikon, wanted Kikon to modernize and become more part of the new world. His brother in arms, Ait Yuganten, wanted Kikon to go in a more isolationist direction. And this fractured the green bones and they broke apart into different clans, the two largest and most influential being Kal Sen's No Peak clan and Ait Yuganten's Mountain clan. While their philosophies differed, their respect for each other endured and Kikon entered the modern world after the Many Nations War united after their independence from Shotar. Now you may think that everything I just said may be spoilers, but no, that was all background, background, <laughs> to what happened before the books even start. So don't worry, this video is going to 
avoid spoilers as much as possible, but I hope you get a sense of the amazing world building the author developed for the series. I'm going to try not to have actual spoilers in this video. So who am I? I am the booktube goddess, the number one drag queen booktuber on YouTube. If you want to see what happens next, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. So what did happen? Time knows no master. As the years caught up with the heroes of Kikon, Kal Sen looks to pass the No Peak clan to his three children, Lan, the older and wiser son, Hilo, the middle child who is sort of a hot-tempered warrior, and Shay, the youngest, a daughter, but she rejects the clan and moves to Esbenia. Our other hero, Ait Yugenten, had no children, but did have an adopted daughter, Ait Mata. When he finally dies of old age, Ait Mata takes over the mountain clan in a rather bloody coup, which was the only way she probably could rise up in this patriarchal Kikanese society. Technology at this point includes colored televisions, machine guns, and many modern 20th century inventions. Each clan is organized among three positions. The Pillar, who is the de facto ruler. The Horn, who leads the warriors that are organized in a very strict hierarchical system. And the Weatherman, who operates the business side of the clan. And the clans pretty much act as police or protectors, and businesses pledged to a clan are then under that clan's protection. So if Jade clans sound like mafia families, you would not be wrong. There are definite Godfather vibes, but with one crucial and rather huge difference. The Jade clans are not criminals. They are a part of the fabric of society. Remember, jade and gold never together. To be a politician in Kikon, you cannot be a green bone, though the politicians are likely to be affiliated with one of the clans. But since the green bones basically have superpowers, they pretty much prop up society. So there's somewhat of a mix between the Mafia and the Justice League. Their power is contained by a self-imposed, very strict honor system, though that does not keep the clans from pretty much remaining in control of Kikone, even if they're in the background. Let's just briefly talk about the magic system. It is a well-developed magic system, but the story focuses so much on the characters and plot that sometimes you forget about Jade or just how powerful Jade really is. I think that makes the Greenbone Saga really stand out among other fantasy series where the magic system is almost relentlessly reinforced on every page. And yes, I'm talking to you, Brandon Sanderson. The first novel, Jade City, basically focuses of the three children of Carl Sen, the revolutionary hero after he retires. And he wanted the No Peak clan to be controlled by all three of his children. Lan as a pillar or leader, Hilo as a soldier or horn, and Shay, his only daughter, as the weatherman running the business side. But things didn't fall out in that direction because, as I said, Shay turned her back on the clan system, and so Call Sen's weatherman, the ancient Doru, remains in that position. And the once peaceful unity of the clans has been broken now that the two heroes no longer control the two main clans because the Mountain Clan is now run by Ait Mata. And she is determined to break the No Peak Clan, so her clan is the largest and most influential, wherein she would effectively run the entire island. This is a dark story, and the author fondly does not pull punches. The second novel, Jade War, continues the rivalry between the No Peak Clan and the Mountain Clan, 
but begins expanding awareness of the wider world around them, notably the two superpowers, Spinia and Yucatan, that was sort of just hinted at or brushed upon in Jade City. Remember, Kikan is the only source of jade in the entire world, and this jade can give superhuman abilities, and the Kikanese are the only people who can apparently use jade. How will superpower countries handle this? Obviously, they want the power of jade for themselves. So what will advances in technology mean? In Jade Legacy, we continue the rivalry among the Jade Bone clans of Kikon, but they are often overshadowed by the superpower giants now, Espenia and Yucatan, either of which could probably conquer them, but they're in conflict with each other in what is called a slow war, where their balance of power means they don't directly go at each other in conflict, but constantly work against each other, usually in other countries where they want to exert their influence. Of course, Kikan is one that both these superpowers want because it is, of course, the only producer of bioenergetic jade. Now, I'll be honest, Jade Legacy is a long book and it feels even longer because we aren't focused mainly on that conflict between No Peak and Mountain. And that makes the pacing feel like it meanders a bit. Not only that, but the children of Kalsen, who are in their 20s and 30s back in Jade City, are now much older and have adult children themselves. This kind of brings to mind the generational family saga books that you really do not see in sci-fi and fantasy very often, but you do see it a lot in mainstream fiction, going back to the Forsyth Saga by John Clansworthy in the 1920s. We also saw The Thorn Birds by Colleen McCullough and many of the novels by James Michener. But for me, the most interesting thing are the parallels of the 20th century Cold War between the United States and Soviet Union. Here it's called the Slow War. And like the Cold War, where the US and USSR fought for dominance in several Asian countries, notably Korea and Vietnam, we see the same occurring in the Jane Bone saga, only with the difference that the people of Kikan have actual super abilities that make them very hard to control. So if Jade is a metaphor for the cultural heart of Kikan, then the appropriation of Jade to other countries becomes a metaphor of cultural appropriation, which becomes quite complicated when Kikan itself sells jade to bolster its economic resources. It's all very complicated. There are so many gray areas. There are so many moral ambiguities. And the real antagonist, at least by the time Jade Legacy comes around, is modernism or globalism and what that means for a small country. And now this is not from the viewpoint of the superpowers. This all comes from the viewpoint of one of those small countries. We don't often get the perspective of the Cold War from say the Vietnamese or Korean point of view. It's always filtered through Western eyes. Take the killing fields, for example. In my opinion, this makes the Greenbone Saga a really significant work, not just as a fantasy series, and it is a great fantasy series, but as a lesson for anyone interested in 20th century history through metaphor and storytelling. I could see this easily being studied as part of a college literary or history course. I will say one thing that bothered me just a little bit was why the superpowers didn't just go directly to war with each other. Now, in the Cold War, the US and USR was at a standstill because of MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction, brought on by the nuclear arms race. But in the Greenbone Saga, I don't believe there are any nuclear weapons. So what was preventing the direct conflict? And what was at the heart of the conflict? Again, in the Cold War, it was capitalism and freedom versus communism and authoritarianism. 
But in Greenbone Saga, it was kind of vague why they were at odds, though it was later revealed there were religious differences. But that's just a small blip in an otherwise really amazing series. Of course, the Greenbone Saga, Jade City, Jade War, and Jade Legacy by Fonda Lee gets my blessing. And if you want to know another book that gets my blessing, just click here. Until we meet again, may all the books you read be blessed. <laughs>